Welcome to this message by Ray Stedman titled, The Call of the Hour, from raystedman.org. The text for this message is from Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. The task of Christianity is not primarily to get us ready for heaven. Though this has been the emphasis in past generations, uh, that in itself is a rather, rather relatively simple task as far as God is concerned. He gets us ready for heaven by an act of faith in Jesus Christ. But the major task of Christian faith is to equip us for life, to live life. And the message of the scriptures, therefore, is how to handle life. And I'm not talking about ideal life, not life as uh, we can think of it on Sunday morning when we're removed from much of the rush and the pressure of our age. But I'm talking about realistic life. Life with its pressures and its problems, with its joys and challenges, its heartaches and its tears, its confusion, its bafflement, its possibilities of greatness. We don't come here on Sunday mornings to huddle together and learn how to hang on. We come here to learn how to uh, handle life so that we can go out and face the worst that can come to us and still stand undefeated. That's what Christianity is about. Therefore, the purpose of the church, and this perhaps helps clarify our thinking these days when so much is troubled and confused in this area, the purpose of the church is not to make the world a better place to live in. It's to make a better people to live in it. And then, as a kind of a byproduct, and always in that relationship, these better people will make the world a better place. Now, to the church, as we've seen in the scriptures, is given the secret of life. Uh, Christians are the only ones who have that secret. That sounds conceited. That sounds arrogant. And yet it is a statement that is uh, based upon the teaching of the word of God from cover to cover. Christ is the secret of life. Christians have Jesus Christ. That's what makes you a Christian. Therefore, Christians to Christians are given the secret of life. And that's why the message of the church never changes. No matter what the age in which we live or the century in which we find ourselves, the message of the church is always the same, always has to be the same. And that's why it's always up to date, because it's always the need of the world in which we live and the age in which we find ourselves. And when the church forgets this and wanders off into peripheral paths and tries to approach the problem of producing the byproduct directly, it loses its influence, its power, and its effectiveness. Now, Paul is very anxious that his readers never forget this fact. As we've been looking at the fourth chapter of Ephesians together, we've seen how he works out in practical detail the effect of this transforming secret in daily life. We learn that this secret put in practice, not just simply believe, that isn't enough, that doesn't do the job, but put into practice makes a Christian stop lying and start telling the truth. It makes him stop losing his temper and start healing his relationships with, his, with those around about him. It makes him stop stealing and start giving. It makes him stop talking dirty and start speaking wisely and helpfully and wholesomely. It even makes him stop harboring inner attitudes of hate and resentment and bitterness and envy and malice and to start forgiving and being gracious and kind to those around about him, even when it's difficult to be. And yet the apostle never wants us to get so wrapped up in the results that we forget what produces them. That's the danger, isn't it? So many times where we're so anxious to get to the end that we forget the pathway that leads to it. 
And so in the midst of this practical dissertation of chapter 4, the apostle breaks off his practical exhortation to restate to us the great secret of Christian living. And we're going to take that today, the first two verses of chapter 5. I have a continual quarrel with the man, whoever he was, who put the chapter divisions in Scripture. This one belongs with chapter 4, these two verses here. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now, there's a great declaration. And perhaps we can analyze this great declaration best by gathering it about four words. The first is to note the apostle's exhortation to us here. Be imitators of God, he says. Flatly, <laughs> blatantly, openly, this is his word. Be imitators of God. And the word for imitators is the word, uh, the, the Greek word that means to mimic, be a mimicker of God. Those who follow the pattern or the example of God. Now that's what Christians are to be. And if you want to put that in one word, you can say it this way. Be godlike. Be godlike. That's the goal of Christianity. It's to produce men and women, boys and girls, who are godlike in the midst of an ungodlike world. That's what it's all about. Now notice, it does not say, be gods. That's what the cults say. That's the lie of the devil. That's the satanic twist to the original declaration of God that uh, distorts the truth and makes it come out as a promise to us that if we, if we follow our own desires, if we throw overboard all restrictions, if we cast aside the bands of authority and do what we want to do, we can be God. For after all, isn't that what God does? He does what he wants. He's sovereign. He does what he likes. But you see, that's the lie. And this is not what Christian faith says. It says, rather, be God-like. That is, reflect the one true and holy God. There's only one God. There only can be one God. It's impossible to have more than one God. By definition, God is a supreme being. How many supreme beings can you have? Only one. Therefore, the Christian message is to be like the one true God. Reflect him in your humanity. Be a godlike man. And from this we get our word, our English word, godly. After all, the word godly that many of us cringe at and, and uh, feel uncomfortable in, in the presence of, is simply the word godlike shortened, that's all. It originally comes from that word, godlikeness. Godlikeness is godliness. Godliness is godlikeness. Now think of that for a minute. What a challenge this is. I submit to you there has never been a higher challenge ever set before human beings than this. Be godlike. Some of you young people are looking for a cause that you can follow. Youth everywhere today is seeking a cause. You're looking for a challenge, a goal that's worthy of living and dying for. Well, what is better than this? Be godlike. There it is. What a challenge. Be godlike in the midst of a world that is set to destroy God-likeness as much as possible. Be different. Come out from among them, these scriptures exhort, and be God-like. You see this all through the New Testament. In the closing part of this letter, the apostle puts it another way. He says, as we've already looked at this exhortation, be strong. Everyone wants to be strong, don't they? 
Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The Lord Jesus said this. He said, be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be godlike. That's the whole exhortation in Scripture. Well, what's God like? What are you going to be like if you're godlike? What will it be like? Will you be strong? Yes, of course. We've already seen this. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. There isn't any strength like God's strength. This is the greatest strength there is. And to be godlike is to be strong. Will you be filled with power if you're godlike? Oh, yes. But be careful. It's a different kind of power than the world looks upon and desires. It's quieter, less apparent, but it's far, far mightier. The power the world admires is power to destroy. The power of God is power to unite. The Lord Jesus said, He that is with me gathereth, but he that is against me scattereth abroad. And in those two terms, he, he characterized the only two kinds of power there are in the world. Power to gather, power to heal, power to bring together, to heal to unite, or power to destroy, power to break up, power to shatter and fragment and divide. Now, that's what it means to be godlike. It's powerful. But will you be realistic? I think if anything is the desire of youth today, it's to be realistic. The one sin they can never forgive is phoniness, unreality. Will you be realistic if you're godlike? Of course, God's the greatest realist there ever was. He's the utter realist. He's never anything but a realist. God always looks at life exactly as it is. He always treats people exactly as they are. He's always tearing aside the veils of illusion that we build around ourselves and revealing to us what we really are. That's realism. <clears throat> Well, will you be happy if you're godlike? Oh, yes. But a different kind of happiness than the world is seeking after. Will you be attractive to others? By all means. There's never anything more attractive than God. He's the most dramatic, compelling, attractive being that ever existed. And yet you'll make some people hate you immediately when they see you if you're godlike. And it, though at the same time they respect you. Because that's what godliness always does, godlikeness. Well, will you be wise and kind? Of course, wiser and kinder than you've ever been before. Because that's what God is. I think we can sum all this up in two words. Godlikeness. Because after all, Despite all the works of God that are evident around about us, both in the natural world and in the world of thought and ideas and so on, uh, as we are creatures of God, we live in these two worlds, of all these works of God, there are really only two, only two things God ever does in human history. That's all, just two. God makes things live. He creates and he redeems. Those are the two things. And everything in the, in, the, in the history of mankind, in all the universe, gathers about those two foci. God creates and God redeems. God makes things live and God, God heals that which is broken. Because God is life and he's love. Those two characteristics. He's therefore our maker and our healer our Savior, our Redeemer. And that's what you'll be if you become God-like. You'll learn how to live. Live as God intended life to be. Live to the fullest capacity of humanity because that's what God is. And you'll learn how to love and heal and restore and bring together instead of scatter and fragment and break apart. 
Now, that's godlikeness. Very desirable, isn't it? Well, how do you do this? Now, the apostle goes on from this exhortation to an explanation. There are two phrases here in this first verse that, that tell us how. Therefore, therefore, you know that old biblical rule, whenever you see a therefore, stop and see what it's there for. <laughs> therefore. And then he adds, as beloved children. Therefore, as beloved children. Now, one is the process of God-likeness, and the other is the prerequisite of God-likeness. Let's take that last one first. The prerequisite of God-likeness. As beloved children. Why does he put that in? Well, that's the only kind of people who can be imitators of God. It's his beloved children. Why? Why only them? because they alone have what it takes, God's life. You see, you can't be God-like without God's life. For after all, no man by himself can be like God. How can we? He who is infinite and we who are finite, he who is, is perfect in all his ways and we so imperfect, he who is unlimited and we so limited, he who is wise and we so foolish, how can man be like God? Well, he can't in himself. The only one who can be God-like is God. But the gospel is this, of course. The good news is when by faith in God's promise you receive Jesus Christ, God's Son, into your life, his life becomes your life. That's the good news. Christ in you, the hope of glory. His life becomes your life. As the Apostle John says, he that has the Son has life. But he that has not the Son of God does not have life. And if you have his life, you have all that he is, all his resources. And that's, of course, how you can be godlike, on his strength on his resources, not yours. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. That's where strength comes. Now, that's the prerequisite, therefore. That's where you have to begin. If you want to be godlike, start there. Receive Jesus Christ, God's Son. Invite him into your life. When you have his life, you can have what he is. Godlikeness. Now let's take the process here that the apostle refers to. Therefore, he says. Therefore. And that's a word that always looks back on something. He's already explained it once. He's just referring to it again. Addressing now Christians, God's beloved children, those who have been born into the family of God by faith in Jesus Christ, he says to them in chapter 4, verse 22, 23 and 24, this is what this therefore looks back at. Put off your old nature, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new nature, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. That is, put off the old life, he says, the natural human life that we all received by being born into the human family. We received it from Adam. Put off the old life as it manifests itself and put on the new life, which is created after the likeness of God. It's God-like. God-like. Now, we learn from Scripture how to recognize the old life. We've already been looking at that. This is a, in the way of review today. We've seen that the old life is always self-centered, always aimed at self, with self at the center of life. Our desires, our aims, our ambitions, our program, our uh, goals, our life. That's the old life. And it expresses itself in lying, and stealing, and immorality, 
also in bitterness, in hate, in revenge, in envy, in unforgiveness, in malice, in fear, in anxiety, in boredom, in restlessness, in cruelty, a whole host of things. These are the signs of the old life. Now again, let me say this. If you're not a Christian, don't try to put these things away. You can't do it because you're part of the problem. Don't try it on that basis. You'll simply deceive yourself and shift from one form of it to the other form. But you won't get away from the problem. You can't. The way to come, the way to to be delivered is come to the deliverer. Come to Christ. Begin there. I've already stressed that. But now, if you are a Christian, you've come to Christ. You can do this, that he says. You put away these things. That's very plain. And your will is involved in this. You simply look at it and you put it away. Now someone says, how do you do that? That's my problem. A woman said to me this last week, this matter of putting off and putting on, how do you do that? Well, if it isn't clear by these terms that are used here, let me use another term that Scripture uses. How do you put off the old life? Well, the Scripture uses this word, confess. Confess. That means not to say you're sorry. That's not confessing. It means to agree with God about what this is. Label it. Name it. Say with. Khan means with, fes means to say, to say with God what he says about it. That's confession. Confess it. And as the Holy Spirit opens your eyes to see yourself, and you begin to see these things in your life, you didn't know they were there, you didn't realize that you were acting these ways until you became a Christian. That's why you can often become more shocked and and miserable and unhappy for times as a Christian than you ever were before because you were drifting on in total oblivion that you were like this. And now the light's on and you begin to see yourself. And when you do, then agree with it. Our immediate reaction is to defend ourselves, to react, to say, oh no, this isn't me. You're talking about my neighbor. They're the ones. I could, uh, I can give you a whole list of people who, who fit these qualifications, but not me. But you see, that isn't confessing. Confessing is agreeing with God about it, that you're in it. Name it. Don't argue with God about it. And name it aloud. Bring it up out of the subconscious into the consciousness of your life and look at it and name it. Because the strange thing about human life and the thing, of course, that God knew about us all along is that what you verbalize, you're able to put aside. If you don't name it, it has a strange power over you. It can continue there. But if you look at it and and name it, verbalize it, you can put it aside. That's why the scripture says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Some of you met during these last few weeks a German pastor who's been visiting in our area, Pastor Hans Hartwig von Gussel, a dear man of God whom I met in Dusseldorf last fall. Recently, he gave me a little treatise he wrote on how to cure anxiety that I found very helpful. And in it is an illustration I'd like to borrow. He says that, that men, Christians, are like a pond in the woods. Uh, on which the leaves are constantly falling. And uh, these leaves fall one at a time, quietly, almost silently, upon the surface of the pond. Those leaves are, uh, are the, the manifestations of the old life. Uh, a little vanity, a little envy, a bit of prideful ambition, some unkindness, a sharp, unlovely word that we speak to another, a lie, some impurity, 
some bit of egotism. These are constantly falling upon the pond of our lives, the surface of our lives. And we don't think they're very important. We think they're just trivialities, mere passing things, but they sink to the bottom and they're forgotten. But they're still there. That's the problem. They're still there. And they rot there. And soon, in the deep subconscious part of our life, there's a foulness, a fetidness, a rottenness that stops the flow of the water, stagnates the pool. And this becomes fertile soil for anxiety. This is where anxieties arise from within us. Those nameless fears and worries that constantly throng us and bother us. Now, in the quiet moments of our lives, we seem to be able to master these better. When a pool is of water lies quiet, even though the bottom is dirty and foul, it isn't very apparent. But any time anything agitates our lives, something bothers us, some circumstance comes in, something irritates us, an agitation is made of the water of our lives, the the dirt at the bottom whirls up and clouds our mind and befuddles us and confuses us. And we act in panic, a panic of anxiety. Now, you see, as the Holy Spirit of God brings to our attention these things, he's lifting up out of the bottom of our life, dredging out the foulness. And one by one, these things are brought to our attention. And if we name them, if we say, yes, Lord, that's, that's me, that's what I've done, that's what I do. Thank you for showing it to me. Then we can put it away. And uh, bit by bit, this will keep coming up, all this foulness, until gradually the pool becomes clear again, it's sunlit and sparkling and open. We haven't anything to hide. We don't try to cover over or pretend we're something else. And that pool, that pond, which has been lying stagnant, becomes a trickle of living water growing into a river at last that flows out to blessing to others. Now that brings us to the third word here. Paul is going back, looking back over what he's covered and giving it to us again. There's the exhortation, be imitators of God. There's the explanation, therefore, on the basis of putting off and putting on Christ as beloved children. Now there comes the demonstration of this. Walk in love, he says. Walk in love. That's the characteristic of a truly Christian life. You know, I've discovered that here's another word that everybody thinks they know the meaning of and very few do. Love. You know what it means to love? Well, it means that you begin to see other people as people instead of obstacles, instead of objects of usefulness to you or obstacles that hinder you. You see them as people like yourself with all the kinds of problems you have and all the difficulties and all the yearnings and the heartaches. They're no longer somebody that's doing something to you. There's somebody you can do something for. That's the difference. Uh, And you discover, as you put on Christ in this way, as you put off these old, ugly things, that uh, you find your attitudes changing. Once you wanted to use people and love things, now you discover you you start to love people and use things. That's the way God intended. And you suddenly are aware that the one that you previously felt so inferior to every time you were with them, you seemed, uh, who always seemed to you to be so poised and confident and certain of themselves. Now you see this to be but a front, and behind it is a lonely, needy person. You just see they've been putting this on, this poise. Behind it, The shell of assurance is a very needy heart. Maybe you invite them out to lunch. 
and you discover that this who this person who was such an obstacle to you is someone like yourself or the one that you feared the one that you thought was cruel and indifferent and hateful and harsh you see now as someone who's been hurt by life who has grown defensive who is who is afraid to let anybody in who builds this rough wall around himself in order to protect himself and you ignore the roughness and speak kindly to the man inside and you get a reaction one that you never expected you find that that uh, as this continues they respond to this or the one that you saw as despised and weak and worthless that useless person you had no use for all of a sudden you begin to see strange little qualities of worth that you never saw before you're learning to love Christ is loving through you it feels like you doing it but you discover that there are things about that person you never noticed and you have a new appreciation for them or oh, you still see the old faults that bothered you once but with them you see something else something new now that's what love means that's what it means to love you want to uphold, uphold them and to help them and when you do without uh, being aware of it all of a sudden you discover that your life has become vital and interesting and fascinating and exciting now that's what God does that's what God likeness is it is and Paul closes this with a wonderful illustration he says Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God that's what he was like he was godlike in fact the lord jesus christ in his life remarkably reveals both god and man the only person in all history who ever did as the son of god he empties himself and he endures the cross in order that he might save man he's outgoing he gives himself up as paul reminds us here He's always thinking of someone else. He's always reaching out towards someone else. And he went to the cross because he was forgetful of himself. He endured the cross. He emptied himself in order to save man. And yet as the son of man, he denies himself and takes up his cross in order to glorify God. Now you see there you have the two brought together. God always reaching out to bless man. And man, if he learns the secret of his life, lives to glorify God. And when you have that, you have a harmony that is constantly working together to produce the wonder of the age, a godlike man, a man in whom God dwells. Be ye imitators of him. Our Father, what a what a magnificent theme is set before us here our imaginations are captured by it as we think of this our hearts respond to it this is what we've always wanted to be like and we we simply can hardly believe our ears that here in this book and by the holy spirit given to us you are telling us how this can be possible Lord teach us to listen he that has ears to hear let him hear that there might break out in our lonely bewildered confused age the wonder of god likeness we pray in his name
Make me different 